Let's turn in our Bibles this morning to John chapter 1. And we're going to be reading verses 1 through 5 and then picking it up again in verse 14. This is the Gospel of John. Hear then what Holy Scripture says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory as of the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts May they be acceptable. May they be beautiful in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. These past few weeks, we have been working through a series called Simply Jesus, where we have been studying what N.T. Wright calls signposts. Signposts, what God has put outside in all of creation or even within ourselves that would point to God. And these are common themes or truths. One is truth itself. And then another signpost is justice. And uh, the issue with these signposts, as N.T. Wright calls them, he calls them broken signposts. Because though God has established these in all of creation, they're broken because of the effects of sin and the fall. Justice has become injustice. Truth has become relativized and there's lots of falsehood out there. And today we are looking at beauty. Beauty as a signpost in which God has established, but beauty as a broken signpost as well. One in which is been disrupted by our sin and our fallenness and our lack of vision that we now have because of sin. How order has now become chaos. How beauty has become marred. How the rose has been trampled. How the dissonant chord has been struck. And how war and tyranny have broken up the peace of beauty. My object- objective here today in this message is threefold. That we In this Advent season and perhaps even beyond until we meet Jesus face to face. That we may see the Lord as beautiful. The author of beauty and worship him in all his splendor and in his majesty. Secondly, that we may dwell on the Lord Jesus. The incarnate word and glory in the beauty of the cross. And then lastly, that we may present beauty back to the world. That we may take it back and then give it back. That we may present it back because we are enabled by the Holy Spirit as Jesus renews us into his image. But before we do all this, I'm going to encourage you online right now in the YouTube comments section as you're watching this. I would like you to type in again voluntary and so forth and you can type in as much as you want here I would like you all to to chat and share a little bit about what you find beautiful share something that you find beautiful something that you smelled something that you heard something you saw something that you tasted something that you apprehended and experienced your knowledge whatever it might be what is something that's beautiful go ahead and type go ahead and type I'll share mine as where I shared a little bit with the kids time but My wife is beautiful. Amy's beautiful. She's been beautiful since I met her. She's beautiful before I met her. She's been beautiful when we got married and she's more beautiful now than when I first met her. Another thing I find beautiful is my children and seeing how they're growing when they're born, how they're growing, how they interact with their grandparents. It's beautiful to me. So keep on typing if you want. We all have seen and experienced beauty in our lives. And just like truth, 
as Ken had spoken about last week, beauty, the study of beauty, aesthetics, as it's called in philosophy, has gone through its seasons as well. And there are differing points of view as to beauty and aesthetics. Is beauty absolute or is it relative? Is it objective or is it subjective? And I would say the majority report, of course, through this time of the post-enlightenment era, this post-modern era that we live, is that many people believe that beauty is subjective. It's what I think beauty is and what you might think beauty is may be different than what I think beauty is. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, we've heard it said. Now I dare you husbands to actually say that to your wife. I think you're beautiful, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But our own experiences and preferences tell us what is beautiful and what is not beautiful. We have this subjective experience and we see this in the realm of art and in the realm of music especially. Now I've been a parent for just about 11 years now, over 11 years, and so I've seen a lot of Disney movies. And there's one Disney movie that's really good. It's uh, Cars. It's a Disney Pixar movie produced in 2006. And uh, there's this scene in which there's two characters interact with each other. And this paints the picture of subjective beauty and differences in beauty. It occurs at sunrise. There's two characters. One is Sarge, who's this army Vietnam veteran war jeep and you know he's got his headlights as his eyes he's got a mustache nose uh, which is the grill and he's got his bumper which is his mouth that talks and then there's Fillmore. Fillmore is this VW microbus with peace signs and flowers on him and he's got this he's kind of slower on the draw and he's got a drawn out voice he's the 60s hippie and so at sunrise Sarge uh, at the moment of sunrise, Sarge raises this American flag and he gives it a salute as he would as a car. And then uh, he plays this song called Revelry, which is used in army camps to draw p- the camp into order. So that's playing. And then at that very moment, Fillmore plays his music. It's Jimi Hendrix doing the Star Spangled Banner at the Wood- Woodstock Festival. And immediately Sarge yells at him, will you turn that disrespectful junk off? And then Fillmore says, respect the classics, man. It's Hendrix. And we see this throughout all families too as teenagers show up with their music and the parents are like, what is this? This is terrible. We may mock what other people find beautiful. We may appreciate what other people find beautiful. But what if I were to tell you that God has a perspective on beauty because God himself is beautiful. That beauty is objective because the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Alpha and the Omega himself is the definition of beauty. You see, in scripture, we don't see a lot of words that we don't see the word beauty spoken so much, but we see another word in there that that captures beauty and that's the word glory the word glory is used several times in the old and the new testament uh, to describe the weight of God the attributes of God he who is in unapproachable light who wraps himself with light as like a garment who fills the temple with his glory the weightiness and the abundance the altogether attributes of perfection and purity and dignity and greatness his immaculate holiness his moral purity that goes beyond our imagination or description. He himself is inherently glorious in his person and in his manifesting of his presence and we can hardly describe God. David writes, One thing I have asked of the Lord and that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And then he writes in Psalm 8, he says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set the glo- your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you would care for him? The Lord himself is majestic and 
beautiful. And his creation, his very creation displays, gives us a snapshot, a snippet of how beautiful the Lord God is. The heavens, says the psalmist, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. All these signs, these are signposts, folks, displaying the work of God. His voice goes out to all the earth, it says. Beauty, glory, the Lord is marvelous and mighty and awesome and splendor. Paul writes that, God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and all things that have been made so that humankind would be without excuse. John Calvin, the reformer, writes, We cannot open our eyes without being compelled to behold him. His essence, indeed, is incomprehensible, utterly transcending all human thought. But on each of his works, his glory is engraven in characters so bright, so distinct, so illustrious, that none, none of us, however dull or illiterate, says Calvin, can plead ignorance as their excuse. Wherever you turn your eyes, there is no portion of the world, however minute, that does not exhibit at least some sparks of beauty That points to the Lord. God is the definition of beauty and creation displays it. And even as God, the master handy worker, created the heavens and the earth, what does he say four times? He said, it is good. He remarks about his creation and he makes an absolute, his stamp of approval that it is good, it is good. And then at the conclusion, after four times, he says one more time at the conclusion on the sixth day after creating humankind in him is his image, he says, it is very good. Humankind, all of creation, is to magnify, is to reflect, is to be a signpost, to point to the beauty and the majesty and the glory of God. You and I, as created beings, are to reflect back to God the beauty of his wonder. He takes Adam and Eve and he places them into the garden and says, go and create and do and be stewards of this earth and co-create with me an enjoyment. That's our vocation. Who made you, says the children's catechism? The answer, God. What else did God make? God made all things. Why did God make you in all things? To give him glory. But that didn't last too long. For the fall occurred, as we know in Genesis chapter 3, introducing murder and lying and stealing and cheating and disunity and idolatry. And once the creative work of God and our mandate to, to work and till the ground and to bring beauty to earth and shine the glory back to God would be marred, it would become burdensome, and all of a sudden things would turn ugly fast. And we see and hear a lot of things that do not bring glory to God. The Egyptian pyramids were made by slaves, concentration camps, mass starvation at the hands of a dictator, all sorts of ugliness, even in this day and age 2020 with all the chaos, ugliness of the pandemic, arguing, spray painting monuments, all these things show how beauty has been marred in our minds and the noetic effects of sin that affect how we interact with each other. It's been marred. But we still see glimpses of beauty, don't we? We see it. We hear it in a symphony. We see it in creation. And since after the fall, God himself has been showing us what beauty is. There's a great example in Exodus 25. God is designing the tabernacle in which he in his glory would dwell among the camp of the Israelites. And he Just like he commands us with the Ten Commandments, he commands Moses to construct the tabernacle in the way that God would design it. God has an objective standard here, an objective standard toward worship. Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering from me, from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. 
These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed in red, and another type of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all his furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. You see, God has this opinion. He has his standards, his command. And we bring in the finest skilled workers to build this tabernacle and to design the priestly garments the way God would have it. His view of beauty of where he would reside. But the pinnacle of beauty is when Christ came and pitched his tent among us. Beauty would be taken back at the moment in which the beautiful Savior, the sovereign, fairest Lord Jesus, in all his glory would veil himself and come down in the shape of a man. We read it. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, says John. We have seen his glory Glory is the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is the eternal Logos, the Word of God, majestically adorned, though veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. And he becomes, he pitches his tent among us as the tabernacle. And John testifies to seeing Jesus' glory in his resurrection, but also the transfiguration where God shares with Peter, James, and John. He overwhelms them with the shadow of his presence, with the glory of his presence, pointing to how Jesus is the glorious and beautiful Savior. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And then the author of Hebrews says he's the radiance of the glory of God. We see the radiance of God in Jesus. We see the beauty and how Jesus conducted himself among his disciples and among the people. Exhibiting the love of God. Exhibiting the justice of God. The compassion of God. And the beauty towards loving others. But the pinnacle of the beauty of Jesus is perhaps at the ugliest moment of his entire ministry. The ugliest moment in all of history just so happens to also be the most beautiful. You see, Jesus, uh, Isaiah speaks of Jesus saying that he lacked beauty that would attract us to him. And he suffered and was humiliated frequently to the point of death on a cross. And yet this cross is the most beautiful event because all of the shame and all of the sorrow, all of the sin, all of the deserved judgment and justice that would come down like a, like a knife upon our heads came upon Christ and was dealt with finally. The beauty of the cross is that Jesus turned away the wrath of God. The beauty of the cross and its ugliness is that Jesus would restore us to relationship with God the Father. That Jesus loves us, that he gave himself for us. Amen. Beauty is restored now through the cross and is being restored. We are being restored into his image. Though we may have subjective eyes of beauty, we are gradually being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. The glory of God dwells in us through the Holy Spirit so that we may begin to see what is truly beautiful and in an objective lens. Jesus is beautiful. And he's transforming our minds and our hearts. And he then gives us a ministry of beauty. Not only are we transformed to then reflect back the glory of God and the beauty of God through faith in Christ, but now we carry a message of that beauty. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are diplomats for the beautiful Savior. And what does, what does it say in Scripture? Not only is the gospel itself beautiful, but Paul writes, he quotes from an earlier verse of scripture, how beautiful are the feet of those who would bring good news. 
Your actions, your words are ministry, are a ministry of beauty. It's a ministry of reconciliation. It's a ministry of beauty. And it can be in the simplest endeavors, not only to speak of Jesus to our coworkers, to our colleagues, to our peers, to our friends, to our family, but also in the good actions of love that we would bring. To turn what is ugly and bring it into beautiful. To turn what is sorrow and to bring it into joy and love. It shows up in how we interact with people. It shows up in how we create things and how we would design things too. Our vocation is now redeemed to be beautiful as well. I think of Facebook and how often social media has been just deluged with all sorts of argument and ugliness. How about we bring beauty back? How about we give beauty back? I think of a couple great examples. I think of Chip Sutton and Linda Bates. Both of them post great stuff on Facebook, somewhat educational, but oftentimes calling out creation and its beauty, showing flowers and animals and telling us things, how we can learn about how God has created things. I see that so often. I encourage you all to do the same. What do we say to people? How might we take what is mundane and make it beautiful? It can be in what we create. It can be in what we say. How can we beautifully express love to our coworkers, to our family? May it be a prayer that we say in the morning. Lord, help me to bring beauty into this life. To restore this broken signpost. To bring beauty back. Jesus calls us to be beautiful. And he actually says, this, this jumped out at me when I read it a few years back. In one passage, Jesus calls something out to be beautiful. I want, you, I want to read it to you. Because it ultimately reflects back to how we are to worship. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper... A woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? They asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you'll always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Jesus comments on how we worship him. How do you worship Jesus? It's not just in singing songs or hearing the word preached, but it is how you live, what you do what you say, what you offer back in sacrifice, what you give for him and his kingdom, and what you boast in, which is in Jesus Christ and in him alone. Bring beauty back this Christmas season. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us a ministry of reconciliation and beauty. Help us to dwell on the cross and the destruction of death that is ultimately glorious and beautiful, which is your resurrection. Thank you that you will one day consummate all things together and it will be perfect and beautiful. But thank you now that we can live in your kingdom and represent you and bring glory back to you in the most beautiful form of worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.